Marilyn Manson, also known as Brian Warner, is one of the most successful and well-known figures in the history of rock. He evolved from a relatively unknown figure in the 90s to a pop culture icon. His mark on rock music is definitive and will last for years to come. But in recent years, with numerous bizarre public appearances, concert cancellations, and injuries, fans have begun to wonder, what's going on with Marilyn Manson? Today in Rock Feed History, we're taking a look at the sad true life story of Marilyn Manson. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe with notifications on. Rock Feed publishes daily hard rock and heavy metal news stories, so subscribe now to make sure you don't miss out on the breaking news. Born January 5th, 1969 in beautiful Canton, Ohio, Brian Warner was the son of Barbara and Hugh. Manson was raised in a religious household attending Heritage Christian School from first to 10th grade. While many were certainly influenced heavily by the curriculum in that school, Manson was shown what he didn't want to be by the teachers who would show them music that was socially unacceptable with his rebellious nature, Warner chose to go against the grain. He later said that he fell in love with what he wasn't supposed to do. Warner's father, Hugh, was a Roman Catholic, and as a child, he regularly attended his mother's Episcopal church. After he attended Heritage Christian School from first to 10th grade, Warner transferred to Glen Oak High School, also in Canton, and successfully graduated there in 1987. His parents then decided to move down to sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where Manson began attending Broward County Community College. Interestingly enough, Manson wanted to pursue music journalism and actually interviewed several successful artists who would later share stylistic similarities to Manson. Manson's childhood wasn't easy. Despite being enrolled in that Christian school and having parents who were generally religious, he experienced obvious traumas while growing up. In a 2015 profile with Rolling Stone, the magazine detailed those traumas, writing, at the age of 13, Brian used to sneak down to his grandfather's basement and watch the old man hunch himself over a toy train set, and they added that he would observe his grandfather watching films. It said, with grotesque guttural noises emanating from a hole left in his throat by a tracheotomy, the boy wasn't so much appalled as fascinated, even mesmerized, the report also described his upbringing, saying, he says he doesn't know why he's like this, but it probably has something to do with his childhood. Growing up as Brian Warner in Canton, Ohio, where his father was a rarely home furniture salesman and his mom a nurse who tended to hover. Fast forward to Fort Lauderdale in 1990. Back at Broward Community College, Warner was studying to become a journalist and he actually completed a few notable interviews, mainly Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. Reznor's musical influence would become clearly apparent in some of Manson's later musical works. In Fort Lauderdale, Warner hooked up with guitarist Scott Puteski and they formed Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids. Later, the Spooky Kids was eventually dropped and it was just Marilyn Manson. Manson later teamed up with Twiggy Ramirez for a side project and in 1993, Manson gained the attention of someone he had previously interviewed, none other than Nine Inch Nails' creative visionary Trent Reznor. Reznor helped produce the 1994 debut album, Portrait of an American Family. He released it on his label, Nothing Records. Manson later joined Nine Inch Nails on tour as an opening act. It was later that Manson would drop Smells Like Children, the 1995 EP that featured the band's first major hit with Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, a cover of the Eurythmics hit. From there, Manson's popularity skyrocketed with his album Antichrist Superstar, which was co-produced by Reznor again, achieving landmark success. Manson graduated from his cult following to outright mainstream success, bringing a counterculture that was just bubbling beneath the surface outright in front of everyone on MTV. Of course, this made Manson patient zero for the religious community who saw him as a perverse figure who was toxic toward the youth in America. One of Manson's earliest run-ins with the morality authorities came in October 1994. While he was touring in support of Nine Inch Nails, Manson was not allowed to take the stage in Salt Lake City after the venue owner took offense to his merchandising and banned him from the venue. Manson and his bandmates would later appear on the ever-popular daytime talk show, The Phil Donahue Show. It was there where the national media got their first taste of Manson's hyper-articulate nature and his ability to make compelling arguments in his favor. With a steady incline and regular rotation on MTV and the radio, 
Marilyn Manson had become a household name. A tragedy would strike on April 20th, 1999 that would cause irreparable damage to his career. On that day, two students at Columbine High School of 12 students and wounded 21 others. With the rapid around the clock media attention frantically searching for a scapegoat, there was a narrative that was beginning to form in the mainstream media that pointed the blame squarely at Marilyn Manson. The media portrayed the attackers as members of a quote unquote trench coat mafia, which was allegedly a gothic cult. They reported that the suspects were wearing Marilyn Manson t-shirts during the claims were later proven to be false. There were sensationalist headlines like shipped rock freak Manson maniac told us to kill thus leading Manson to become widely criticized by various religious political and entertainment industry figures even Manson's peers in the entertainment industry criticized the singer unfairly Leonard Skinner purportedly offered to give the frontman quote a can of whoop ass Marilyn Manson later came out in defense of himself in an op-ed piece published by Rolling Stone on June 24th 1999 several months after the tragedy occurred. He wrote in part, It is no wonder that kids are growing up more cynical. They have a lot more information in front of them. They can see that they are living in a world that's made of bullshit. In the past, there was always the idea that you could turn and run and start something better. But now America has become one big mall. And because of the internet and all the technology we have, there's nowhere to run. People are the same everywhere. Sometimes music, movies, and books are the only thing that let us feel like someone else feels like we do. I've always tried to let people know it's okay, or better, if you don't fit into the program. Use your imagination. If some geck from Ohio can become something, why can't anyone else with the willpower and creativity? I chose not to jump into the media frenzy and defend myself. Though I was begged to be on every single TV show in existence, I didn't want to contribute to these fame-seeking journalists and opportunists looking to fill their churches or to get elected because of their self-righteous finger-pointing. They want to blame entertainment? Isn't religion the first real entertainment? People dress up in costumes, sing songs, and dedicate themselves in eternal fandom? Everyone will agree that nothing was more entertaining than Clinton shooting off his prick than his bombs in true political form. And the news, that's obvious. So is entertainment to blame? I'd like media commentators to ask themselves because their coverage of the event was one of the most gruesome entertainment any of us have seen. I think that the National Rifle Association is far too powerful to take on, so most people choose Doom, The Basketball Diaries, or yours truly. This kind of controversy does not help me sell records or tickets, and I wouldn't want it to. I'm a controversial artist, one who dares to have an opinion and bothers to create music and videos that challenge people's ideas in a world that is watered down and hollow. In my work, I examine the America we live in. I've always tried to show people that the devil we blame our atrocities on is really each one of us. So don't expect the end of the world to come one day out of the blue. It's been happening every day for a long time. Manson told The Guardian in a 2017 interview, that's going to be a great pull quote for you, but honestly, the Columbine era destroyed my entire career at the time. Manson later appeared in the Eminem music video for his hit single, The Way I Am, where Eminem briefly touched on the topic. It's clear that Marilyn Manson had many traumatic experiences in his life, both before he was famous and since he became famous. In recent years, Marilyn Manson has repeatedly made headlines for bizarre onstage behavior. There's been a recurring theme in the outbursts on stage. Manson appears to incoherently yell at fans in the crowd or at his own crew. He's even become hospitalized due to falling props on stage, causing him to become injured and have to cancel numerous shows. Here's a 2012 clip of Rob Zombie cussing out Marilyn Manson because the two purportedly had a feud over Manson refusing to shorten his set times or start his set on time to begin with. The two have since buried the hatchet. <laughs> So it begs the question, where does the entertainment end and the reality begin for Marilyn Manson? There are some who speculate that all of it is merely performance art with Marilyn Manson, but there are others who have genuine concern for his well-being. But Manson is such an accomplished showman, it makes it nearly impossible to tell reality from fiction. On one hand, 
It's sad to see Manson's sometimes incoherent behavior on stage, but on another hand, Manson has always been skillful at knowing what people want. After all, he has a background in music journalism. He's far more qualified than most to understand what will generate headlines. So Marilyn Manson is currently working on another new album, which means another tour, which is already scheduled in partnership with Rob Zombie. That likely means another summer of headline generating performances or cancellations. Maybe we've all been duped by one of the greatest performance artists of all time. Or maybe Brian Warner and Marilyn Manson have become entangled, unable to separate reality from fiction, and the personal demons that may have affected Brian Warner are easily masked by merely chalking it up to a character playing a role 24 hours a day. We'll never really know, unless Marilyn Manson chooses to let us in on that. And the likelihood of that, slim to none. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us today on Rockfeed. You can subscribe with notifications on so you don't miss out on breaking hard rock and heavy metal news. You can also check out these recommended videos and see more mini documentaries on our channel under the playlists. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you all very soon.